This is the face of evil. I, I abduct, raped and killed Hena Foster. His name, Maninda Pal Singh Kohli. And I just, you know, the strangled her, you know, like your toe, you know, the whole with that way and put a hand on that her mouth and killed her. This is the story of a manhunt that took more than five years, spanned thousands of miles, and involved finding one person hidden in a nation of over a billion. Hillary and Trevor Foster, together with Hampshire police, took this unwanted journey on behalf of their murdered daughter, Hannah. Against all the odds, the final destination was eventually the dock of a British court in Hampshire, which is where Hannah lived with her parents, Hillary, Trevor, and her younger sister, Sarah. She wanted to look after me, but I'd think that, I don't know, in a way, she sort of needed looking after as well. For as long as anyone could remember, Hannah had one ambition, to become a doctor. She was a perfect student. She was gifted, she worked really hard, and she was a straight-A student, so she would have gone on to get three, four A-levels, should have gone on to get a degree in medicine, should have gone on to become a brilliant doctor and help lots of people in her life. The lasting memory or memories that I have of Hannah really is her smile, that she was always happy, she was always sort of contented, she would always have, you know, a, a, a positive outlook on life. She was very sort of sociable and caring and just out to help everyone, I think. There are a lot of people like that, but she just sort of seemed to somehow bring it together to be <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Hannah's kind nature and desire to put others first had terrible consequences for her on Friday the 14th of March 2003 when she met her friend Helen in the Bevos Valley area of Southampton. Drinking just a couple of hundred yards away was Hannah's eventual killer, Maninda Pal Singh Kohli. He arrived in Southampton eight years earlier. Although an Indian national, he was given permission to stay in the UK following an arranged marriage to his British-born wife, Shalinda. He was a boy that had been born in India, educated in India, and had found his bride through a newspaper advert. And that was his escape from his life in the Punjab to a better life, he thought, in this country. He was... Um, first of all, on the face of it, a family man. He was married with, with, with two children. He was a very plausible, uh, 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 meaningful type of guy. He got on well with people, but there was, a, there was another side to him. He drank heavily, he gambled heavily. Um, he had a reliance on prostitutes. Um, he had a, a very much a, a double life that his wife was unaware of. On the night Hannah went missing, Curly was with his wife in the early part of the evening. And then at some point he went out and he went to local pubs in the area. One of those pubs was the Mitre pub. Just before closing time, Coley left. At the same time and just 100 yards away, Hannah and her friend also left their bar. They'd gone to a couple of bars, decided there wasn't much going on, hadn't bumped into their friends that they wanted to, decided to walk together all the way up um, Portswood High Street, you know, literally just a few hundred yards from Hannah's house. This is CCTV footage of Hannah walking Helen to the bus stop on Portswood Broadway. 
Hannah stayed with her at the bus stop and when the bus arrived, um, Hannah turned to walk towards her home. After Hannah had seen her friend safely onto the bus, Coley spotted her. In Highfield Lane, Southampton, just turning into the junction with um, Shaftesbury Avenue, Hannah turns and waves to Helen as the bus drives past, and that's the last time Helen sees Hannah. But unbeknown to Hannah, Coley was now lying in wait. You know, he's parked that van, knowing that, you know, she could, may well be coming that way. Hannah is a very, very slight girl, um, very, very petite. She would have been like a lamb to a slaughter. This was a 16-stone man, a very big, swarthy man with only one thing on his mind. You know, Hannah wouldn't have had a chance against him. Whenever Hannah um, stayed out late or was staying overnight, she would always contact her mother by text or phone. It was totally out of character not to tell her parents where she was. At five o'clock in the morning, Hannah's parents started texting her. But there was no response. At 10.30, her father, Trevor, called the police. Her parents, her loving parents, had become concerned the following morning uh, when they realised their daughter wasn't at home uh, had taken steps to try to contact her on her mobile phone. Uh, I'm uh, calling about um, a missing person, my daughter. All to no avail. There was no history of her going missing at all previously. There was no obvious reason as to why she would seek to go missing and not inform anybody. So on the face of it, we knew that we were likely to be investigating a potential abduction. House to house inquiries drew a blank. The only lead was Hannah's phone. Hannah's mobile phone was switched on at this stage and it was emitting a signal to various mobile phone masts called cell site hits. Every time a mobile phone makes or receives a text or a call, it transmits a signal to a receiver on a phone mast. This registers an approximate location for the phone. Using the data provided, we were able to map the location of Hannah's mobile phone each time it was called or received a text message. It was clear that from the data, the phone was in a vehicle that was traveling between Southampton and Portsmouth on the morning of Saturday the 15th. But we didn't know if Hannah was with the phone then, two final pieces of information finally confirmed what the police had always feared. Hannah's phone had stopped moving and was somewhere in Portsmouth. And at 11pm on the night she disappeared, Hannah had dialed 999. But why hadn't the police responded? The police investigation into the disappearance of Southampton teenager Hannah Foster was about to become a murder inquiry. Hannah had now been missing for 28 hours, and mobile phone data revealed she had somehow managed to make a desperate 999 call minutes after this man, Meninda Pal Singh Kohli, had abducted her. The 999 call was absolutely critical. First of all, it, it certainly set this case apart from, from most others. Um, there was a genuine, tangible reason to believe that something had befallen Hannah. But why hadn't the emergency services responded? The answer was terrifyingly simple. The Trouble Nine operator, um, if she doesn't hear anything from the caller, will um, transfer that call to an automated system and if after a further period of time there's no response made 
by the caller, then that phone call is terminated. And that's what happened in this instance. Because Hannah was unable to speak, the call was um, disconnected. Hannah, being in that terrible situation where she's been kept against her will, she's been either being restrained or she's been hurt in some way, she still has the, the forethought to actually try and raise the alarm. And that, to me, is bravery beyond measure. Once we played the tape through, uh, and it was only uh, about 58 seconds long, it's less than a minute, it was clear that we had a serious problem and that she'd been abducted. From the sound of the recording, it did appear as though Hannah was certainly in a vehicle, and perhaps a larger vehicle, a van-type vehicle. It was clear that we were dealing with a male who didn't have English as his first language, and it would appear the most likely ethnicity of the person would have been Asian. The Asian male was clearly in control of the situation, even in the short span of conversation that we heard, uh, and was directing her, for instance, to put her head down out of the way, in order, obviously, that she couldn't be seen. The thing that struck you most was the fear in her voice, which sort of sent the cold chill down your spine, and, and that's when I think you knew, well, there's a good chance we're not going to get her back alive. There was only one thing on his mind that evening. She knew she was in a serious, serious predicament. She knew she was in danger. Um, those last hours must have been absolutely terrifying for her. Police were still clinging to the hope that somehow, and against all the odds, Hannah might just be found alive. Later that afternoon, that hope was gone. I recall being in the, in the incident room myself when news is starting to filter through that, that a body had been located on the outskirts of Southampton. And certainly I, I vividly remember the incident room, a hush falling over it and radios being turned up to listen to what was being reported back by those officers that were at the scene. Uh, and it soon became apparent that um, it was the body of a young, a young lady uh, who matched the general description of Hannah. Hannah's battered body was discovered in Allington Lane, Southampton, by a passing motorist. She had been raped and murdered. 24 hours later, at a recycling plant in Portsmouth, police recovered Hannah's bag, her phone was inside and was still switched on. Desperate to find their daughter's killer, Hannah's distraught parents, Trevor and Hilary Foster, made an emotional appeal for information. We as a family are devastated by the loss of Hannah. My wife and I have lost our beautiful daughter and Hannah's 14-year-old sister, Sarah, has lost her big sister and her friend. Please, please help us. If you have any information that would help the police to solve this evil crime, we need you to come forward to assist their inquiries. They told me that when they saw Hannah, in the mortuary. They held her hand and they both made a silent promise that as long as it would take, that they would get justice for her, that they would find the man that did this and they wouldn't rest until they'd found him and had him behind bars. From a professional point of view, we've got a horrendous crime that's been committed. Um, but as a, as a father myself, um, you, know, you think about the, the human tragedy that's, that's involved as well. Um, so you can only but imagine what the parents must be going through. Uh, and so there is a desperate desire um, to do what you can, what small part that you can play uh, in order to, um, to some small degree, put right what's happened. What is important now is to catch this person or persons who have perpetrated this cruel and brutal... Trevor and Hillary's appeal touched the heart of everyone and a massive media campaign swung into action. I've been a police officer for 15 years. I've lived in Southampton for 42 years. It's the biggest case that I know of. It was on every billboard. Hannah's photograph and the, and the, you know, 
anybody that can help, the posters that we had printed were everywhere. Every shop, window, every bus you went, got on, the library, absolutely everywhere. Everybody was talking about it. We had lots and lots of calls to our newsroom. We realised at once that this story of what happened to Hannah had really touched a nerve with the nation. People wanted this man caught. They wanted the person responsible for killing Hannah brought to justice. A wealth of forensic evidence was found on both Hannah's body and her clothes. Her bloodied coat contained a full DNA profile of Coley, but he wasn't on the national DNA database, so the police didn't yet know he was the killer. What they did know was Hannah had been abducted by an Asian man in a diesel van. And by cross-referencing CCTV with Hannah's mobile phone location, they narrowed their hunt down to seven possible vehicles. With that information, they made a nationwide appeal. Mr Coley's employer uh, rang in uh, and put Mr Coley's name forward. Mr Coley was a delivery driver for uh, a firm that delivered sandwiches and other foodstuffs uh, in the Southampton and Portsmouth area. Now, what he was also able to give us as his employer was the registration number of the van that he was using. And hey presto, Coley's van turns out to be one of those seven that had been highlighted. Coley's van had been filmed at every key location on CCTV. We get Hannah making the treble nine call um, on the Friday night at 11 o'clock in, in the northern end of Southampton, going towards the M27 from Portswood. We look at CCTV, sure enough, the van used by Coley's on that. And it's quite a distinctive van, because if you look there, there's some sign writing on the side of the van, but also there's a, a refrigeration unit um, on top of the van. Um, and that was part of the noise, actually, you could hear on the um, treble nine call. There was also footage of Coley travelling past a Texaco garage, close to where Hannah's body was found. There are three sightings at this location at um, different times of the night. Um, Coley is going one way, um, and then he's going another way, and then he's coming back towards Allington Lane on the last occasion, timed at 3.15 in the morning. We look at CCTV. Our theory was right. It's southbound on the M275 into Portsmouth. So the coincidences start to run out for him, you know. The icing on the cake then is when we come to the South Sea area. It's here that Hannah's mobile phone stopped moving and once again Coley's van is caught on camera. And in actual fact it was an area that he wasn't due to go to so that was quite a significant bit of CCTV. We straight away went down to his, his employer at the time uh, and sealed off the premises. We seized the van that Coley used and um, as a result of examination of that van, we found evidence of uh, Hannah's blood as well as DNA evidence which puts Hannah in that vehicle and Coley. Inside Coley's van, police found Hannah's hair along with her blood on a chrome pole. Coley's semen was also on the vehicle's seat. This matched the DNA profile found on Hannah's jacket. The evidence was, was mounting up against him uh, and, and it was clear that you know, we felt that he was our man. The forensic evidence, the phone evidence, the CCTV evidence, everywhere that we could possibly look to test things, Mr Coley's name was, was cropping up and there does come a time when you, you, you say this is beyond coincidence. Thirteen days after Hannah was abducted, raped and murdered, police knew who their man was, Maninda Pal Singh Kohli. They went to his house to arrest him. We had a good look round. It was completely empty. You could see that from the, door, uh, from the windows. There was nothing inside, no curtains, no furniture. It was just completely empty. Kohli's wife, Shalinda, was tracked to her nearby parents' house. She explained that her husband had rushed to India to see his sick mother. Uh, she was very gravely ill in the Punjab and 
Coley wanted to go and see her because he was really worried that she was going to pass away before he saw her. Four days after killing Hannah, Coley had gone on the run, which this CCTV footage from Heathrow Airport confirmed. Coley had boarded a flight to Delhi. His mother um, was in a coma. She'd been hit by a bus um, some months before. But when Coley arrived in Chandigarh, it was a, a big surprise to his father. He didn't know he was coming. He got himself a, a little place in a flat just around the corner where he lived for five or six days. But he, he didn't really do anything. He didn't go out. He was very, very... Neighbours said he was seen to just stick himself indoors. He, he didn't mix with anybody. Um, he just spent most of his time at his mother's. But for Coley, this wasn't a mercy mission to visit his dying mother. He was over. Only interested in escaping British justice. Within days, word got through to his brother, Ishpreet, that Hampshire police were trying to arrest Coley. Ishpreet was a local police officer and in denial about Coley's guilt. The 29th, 28th, I had a wife's phone. I said, I had a problem with my wife. I said, I had a problem with my wife. I was falsely implicated by my wife. I was also involved in the police. यूके पे जो मेरे ख्याल में इधर उस दिन ही उस तो नेक्स्ट मॉर्निंग चे चला गया सी गई तो बट कोली वाज नॉट अबाउट टू यूज हिज रिटर्न टिकट टू द यूके इंस्टेड ही कट हिज हेयर शेव्ड हिज बीड एंड कैरीड ऑन रनिंग इट शोज यू द कैरेक्टर एंड द पर्सनालिटी ऑफ दिस मैन दे कुंड पुट हिज हैंड्स अप टर्न हिमसेल्फ इन कम he only thought one person, that was himself. Back in the UK, Coley's wife then made a startling admission. She told me that when Coley went to the pub, he went in his van, his works van. That's the only vehicle they had. When he came back, he was really, really upset. She told me that he had a scratch on his face and she told me that he had told her that while he was in the pub, somebody, he doesn't know who, had opened his van up and put a body in it. So when he came out, he'd found this body and he'd driven home uh, with the body in the back of the van. Um, Shalinda was adamant that she hadn't seen the body, she'd had nothing to do with the van. And she said, if after all, after he told us that, um, he was very, very upset and they fell asleep. And after a couple of hours of sleep, he got up and went. Like the rest of Coley's family, his wife refused to believe he was guilty. As far as she was concerned, we had the wrong person. And we needed to be putting our investigation somewhere else and concentrating our efforts somewhere else. Shalinda was arrested, but later released without charge. And then Southampton detectives did concentrate their efforts somewhere else, they focused on the Herculean task of trying to find one man in a country of over a billion. India is a, is a vast country with a, with a vast population, and on the face of it, it was the proverbial needle and haystack. Maninda Pal Singh Kohli was on the verge of disappearing. Forever. The horrific abduction, rape and murder of Southampton teenager Hannah Foster had made this man, Maninda Pal Singh Kohli, the UK's most wanted. Days after murdering Hannah, he fled to India. On his tail were detectives from Southampton. One of the biggest frustrations was we couldn't go to the Punjab. The Ministry of External Affairs would not allow us on that first visit to go to the Punjab, which is where we needed to be. We needed to speak to the family, we needed to, to gather the evidence of his last sightings. 
the Indian police at the time were saying he'd killed himself. That was their theory for the first six weeks. He's probably dead in the river uh, and topped himself and would never find the body. But uh, the way he, he's a coward and he wouldn't have done it. The thing is, in India, this type of murder happens every single day. So when we told them about Hannah, they were concerned, you know, they, they could understand why we were there, but they've still got all the investigations they've got to do as well, haven't they? So she didn't take a priority. There's 1.2 billion people there. It's a huge, huge area. They've got vast amounts of crime themselves to deal with. You can understand them trying to solve their own crimes first before they look for one that was perpetrated 4,000 miles away. The Punjab police, I don't think, would have moved their little finger to do anything uh, in this particular case because it was not their headache. It was not their problem. It had happened in Britain. Red tape, bureaucracy and a lack of available manpower had given Kohli a crucial head start. Although we weren't totally losing hope, we, we were beginning to wonder, you know, are we ever going to get a, a successful resolution to this? We didn't even know if he was if he was still alive. He you know, he disappeared away from his family in India um, to where we didn't know. Kohli was now 600 miles away, close to the border with Nepal in the West Bengal city of Darjeeling. I met him as a tourist. He was in my taxi, you know. He told me like he was a delivery driver like in, back home in London. So he had his family down up there. So he told me he had just come for vacation. He was known as Mike actually. Mike. And I, I just remember Mike only because he never gave his second name to me. So we used to call him I used to call him Mike. Despite now having a new name, Mike Dennis and a new identity, Coley never felt truly safe. The newspaper used to come around over 8 o'clock. It comes late in Darjeeling. He used to go for the headlines and just turn the pages all the way. Within five minutes, the newspaper is finished. You know? He always used to tell me, even if I die here, you just inform the police, he'll be loaded. You know? I just used to find it as a joke all the time. Six hundred miles away, the Indian police had finally allowed their colleagues from Hampshire access to the Punjab. The best guess at the time was that he was in the Punjab because he had family to look after him. In any family, you know, there is that commitment to your children, to your, fa you know, to your brother, sister. Um, how else was Coley surviving? We often wondered how he was supporting himself, and um, it is still a bit of a mystery as to how he did support himself. But, like he did in this country, he used other people, and I believe he may have used other people in India to support himself, um, in particular his, his family. But Kohli's father insisted he was not sheltering his son. I say if he has committed crime, hang him. I will be the last person to protect him. If he has done this crime, he should be punished and he should face the music, he should face the consequences as per law. I will not uh, protect. And if he is innocent, God will protect Hampshire police still had no idea where Coley was, but they were sure someone did, and together with the son, they came up with a plan to flush him out. Along with Hampshire Police, we put up a substantial reward of five million rupees, which is the equivalent of seventy thousand pounds. In a country like India, that's like a lottery win. There had to be a substantial amount for the Asian community to realise how serious um, what Kohli had done was, and how important it was for the British police to capture him. After laying low, Kohli was back on the run, this time to the small town of Kalimpong. He 
he joined the Red Cross group, and the Red Cross group was based in, in Kalimpong, involved with uh, vaccination of the local inhabitants there. He told the uh, Red Cross Society guys that he, uh, he was from uh, World Health Organization as a member. So everybody used to think that like, he's a doctor and even my auntie could call him like doctor, doctor. That's why he came very close to you know, the locals very quickly. It just shows him basically almost in a, in a Jekyll and Hyde light. Um, there's this obviously evil and vicious raping murderer that he is. But then just as easily, he can just, just switch. He can be the aid worker, um, looking after sick, helpless, ill people. Um, he can just change his persona, you know, just like with the click of the fingers. It, it just, you just can't help but despise the man. Coley was growing in confidence. He had a new name, job, identity, and despite already having a wife and two children in Southampton, he decided to remarry. Bigamously. It's almost chameleon like he's just started a new life over again. There's no thought of his wife, no thought or contact with his two sons. He's just cut that off and he's just decided to start again. He felt safe, he felt secure, um, he thought, he, 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 he felt that he got away with it. But Hampshire police and the Fosters were about to play their ace card. In an unprecedented move, Hillary and Trevor travelled to India and appealed directly to 1.2 billion Indians for help. We're determined to make the most of this our time in India and do everything we can to raise the profile of the case and to help the police. The reward of £70,000 had stood in India for six months, but still nobody had come forward. The Fosters going out there in person was the ace card. If this didn't bring Coley out of the woodwork, then nothing would. Knowing we were not there to help her in her hour of greatest need, it leaves us with a sense of guilt we will carry to our graves. They just basically, on a person-to-person -person level, just appealed to them, just please help us. We can't do it without you. She didn't deserve to die so young, in such a callous and terrifying manner. <laughs> Her killer must be brought to justice. The media picked it up big time. All the national news channels picked it up. Their press conference was a prime time news story for us. Hillary and Trevor's emotional appeal moved the Indian nation to join the fight for justice. They understood, you know, they sympathized. It was a sad, moving story with parents making an emotional appeal and uh, with Indians, emotion really works. Until now, only a few really knew about the hunt for Kohli. But not anymore. The Foster's message hit even the remotest parts of India. I saw his fixes uh, on the telly and it was a disguised photo, like with all the beards and head, head scarf. But his eyes looked f very familiar to me, uh, and I thought uh, it's Mike Dennis. So I, I phoned uh, the helpline. I just turned to the TV and I just tried to look at him, you know. And as soon as I saw him, you know, I, I started like to fever myself. You know, I, I knew this guy. Coley knew his time was up. Everywhere he went, people looked for him. Coley had fled Kalimpong and he was actually with his wife, Barty, and they were making their way towards the Nepalese border. And if he made it over the border, he really would disappear forever, as there was no extradition treaty with Nepal. We had almost lost hopes. We felt that maybe he has given us a slip. Then one of the officers rings me up and tells me that we are getting information that he is going to a relative's house in Panighata. Their information was right. 
Coley had made his way to his wife's family just 30 minutes from the border. The West Bengal police knew they had to act immediately. We decided we should alert our local police station unit. The officer in charge, Mr. V.K. Singh, he reaches that house and he says that he has gone to a nearby bus stand to catch a bus. But Rajiv's officers were still two minutes away and Kohli was about to board a bus to Nepal and freedom. So Rajiv phoned through all the information he had to a local off-duty officer. Look for a man in a red T-shirt travelling with a woman. This guy is not part of the operations. He doesn't know who is Maninder Pal Kohli. Then he comes across a lady and a man uh, who is wearing a red T-shirt. He did not accept that he is Maninder Pal Kohli. He gave a false name. Kohli claimed his name was Mike Dennis. The local police officer didn't believe him, and 16 months after murdering and raping Hannah Foster, he was arrested. If the West Bengal police hadn't have acted the way they did, he could well have gone across the border, and that would have been it. We wouldn't have ever, ever seen him again. Cody was just minutes from getting away with this murder. If that bus had come along, he'd have been across the border, he'd have been safe. It was such um, an amazing experience to, to hear that he actually had been arrested. It was, it was totally unexpected and probably all the better for it, really. I was elated, absolutely elated. And so fantastic that it had happened while the Fosters were there. Never in our wildest dreams do we expect an arrest to be made while we were in the middle of this short visit. All the Indian journalists were around them, slapping on, on the back, just cheering with them. It was just, it was just, it had come so quickly. And I think, you know, that, that they, they had sort of resigned themselves to the fact that they might not ever find him. But to actually be in India, um, be there, and know that he was coming down to Delhi and you know, that he would have his day in court and they would have their day in court. It was just, it was just a marvellous feeling. And then the investigation took an almost unbelievable turn, as the man who for the past 16 months had lied to his friends and refused to speak to the police suddenly found his voice and for once told the truth. He sat down and, you know, I started by, I think, asking the most obvious questions and I was really surprised that he was actually quite forthcoming. Actually, I done a crime over there. That's why I, you know, ran from there to come in here. What happened? I, I abduct, raped and killed Hannah Foster. Why are you admitting this to the media? Why are you admitting this now? I did it because I am already too tired, you know, the to run here and there, here and there. And I want to unburden myself. I totally want to tell the truth. And then he went on to tell me all these details about how he'd followed her. And I remember, you know, even about the fact that how he'd strangled her. And I just, you know, the strangled her, you know, like just the whole, you know, the whole with her, that way and put her hand on that, her mouth, and killed her. The way he talked about it, the way he described it, um, it was so clear that he was guilty. Despite Kohli's confession, within days he reverted to lying. The battle to bring him back to face British justice would not be straightforward. After spending 16 months on the run, this man, Maninda Pal Singh Kohli, had at last been arrested by Indian police. I, I abduct, raped and killed Hena Foster. His arrest came after an emotional appeal direct to the Indian population by Hannah's parents. She didn't deserve to die so young, in such a callous and terrifying manner. Hampshire detectives were now attempting something never achieved before, to extradite an Indian national to the UK. In terms of the, the legislation and, and the extradition, that was 
new territory. Nobody had been successfully extradited uh, under that partic particular piece of legislation uh, between India and, and the UK. After a 16-month manhunt, Trevor and Hillary were about to meet the man who raped and murdered their teenage daughter. It wasn't actually until I came face to face with him that I turned to Trevor and I said, I now understand this word hatred. He looked so cocky and sure of himself in, in the court, surrounded, you know, he had his brother there, and it was, it was just sort of like a joke. Both Trevor and I were just shaking with rage. We want to say only one thing, that he is an innocent. And he has been, uh, he has been framed only from, uh, for being an Asian. Coley only thought about himself, um, and his prime motivation was to try to avoid being prosecuted and convicted of this offence. He tried every trick in the book through his Indian defence lawyers to try and delay the extradition. He feigned illnesses, um, members of his legal team just wouldn't turn up, so the cases were adjourned. It was cold, it was calculating. He knew he'd killed, but he didn't want to face up to justice. Coley's relentless lying was piling even more pressure on Hannah's grieving parents, Trevor and Hillary. To compound matters, Hillary wasn't just fighting for justice, she was also battling breast cancer. But somehow, she found the strength to appeal directly to Coley. He's, he's lodged in jail number four. You want to give him this case? It's a very personal letter. It's an appeal to Coley to remind him that actually this is having a terrible impact on our family, but equally on his family too. I don't think that their work and participation can be understated. Um, Trevor and Hilary did absolutely everything that they could as loving parents for Hannah from the moment that they woke up on that Saturday morning realised that their beloved daughter wasn't in the house. Uh, and thereafter, I mean, I witnessed it at first hand on one visit they made to India, the tireless work campaigning that they did to ensure that everything was being done to make sure that this man came back to the UK to, to face trial. You know, sometimes you just feel physically exhausted. We're going through a sort of roller coaster of emotions and, and you just think, no, we've got to keep going, we've got to keep going for Hannah and that does, it's the driver. It was over a hundred court hearings um, over three years, 30 appeals before the High Court judge at Delhi finally, having assessed all the evidence, decided there was a case to answer and gave the British police permission to come and get him. So in, in, in summer 2007, uh, myself and, and, and two colleagues um, went to, uh, to New Delhi um, expressly to, to bring Coley back. I do recall he made uh, an off-the-cuff comment um, along the lines of, you win some, you lose some. Uh, and, uh, and I took that to mean that he tried his best um, to, uh, to frustrate being brought back to the UK, but he'd, he'd event it's eventually proved futile. Four years after running from British justice, Coley was at last back in the UK. I looked at him in the face and charged him with the kidnap, rape and murder of Hannah Foster. And after charging him, um, there was no emotion in him whatsoever. He was just completely um, without emotion. It will stay with me for a long time. In October 2008, Coley was brought to trial at Winchester Crown Court. I think the circumstances of this particular case touched everybody. Hannah was a, was a lovely, gentle girl um, who was very popular uh, and certainly had an awful lot to give the world. Going through the investigation um, and speaking to Hilary and Trevor, um, I just felt that I got to know Hannah a little bit. She was bright and intelligent and a lovely person to be with and to know. 
unfortunately now Hannah was, is unable to fulfil her dreams and aspirations um, and grow up to be the person that she could have been. Coley's court romantics continued right up until the end of the trial. Throughout the six-week trial, um, Coley wouldn't accept at all any of the evidence that was pre presented to the court, but um, the evidence was overwhelming. At the end of the trial, the jury filed in. It was such a tense, emotional moment for everyone. You could hear a pin drop. When the foreman of the jury was asked to deliver his verdict and he stood up and said guilty, it was just, I just looked over at the Fosters and it was just, the emotion was unbelievable. Hillary and Trevor had at last fulfilled their promise to their daughter Hannah. Manindapal Singh Kohli was sentenced to life in jail and ordered to serve at least 24 years for the false imprisonment, kidnap, rape and murder of Hannah Foster. When I saw Mr and Mrs Foster and their daughter, Sarah, walking out of the courtroom down the steps towards the media pack, my heart went out for, to them and I really felt quite emotional because I realised that this was the end for them and what they must have gone through. Um, it doesn't bear thinking about. We've waited nearly six years for this moment and we're physically and emotionally exhausted. It's taken every opportunity to delay and pervert the course of justice. Today, finally, justice has caught up with him. Coming up this week, cameras record the work of all three emergency services, offering a comprehensive view of those who keep the city of Sheffield safe. That's Total Emergency on Wednesday night at 10.35.